Um, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to this open licensing webinar. My name is Elizabeth Oyange. I am one of the facilitators for uh, the September courses on CC. Um, and I'd also like to welcome um, our other facilitators. I can see Paul is here. Um, and to our uh, guest for today, Meredith uh, Jacob. Meredith, I know you like doing your introductions, but if you don't mind, I can also uh, quickly run through your introduction. Whatever and, you like. Uh, okay. Um, let me do this real quickly. So um, Mary J Jacob is the director of the project on copyright and open licensing at the program on information justice and intellectual property at American University Washington College of Law. She is the co-author of the best practices and fair use uh, for open educational resources and the public lead for Creative Commons United States. Her other work includes serving on the steering committee of the open patent pledge and the low uh, carbon patent. So do I am going to let uh, you on open licensing. Welcome, Meredith. Thank you. Um, and thank you all for joining us. I see we have a big group of participants this morning. That's great. Um, and I'm always excited to get to talk to the folks in the um, Creative Commons certificate about these questions about sort of copyright and the technicalities of the license. And I think it really serves a dual purpose because the other thing we're doing here is talking about and then modeling how, um, as you go forward in almost all cases, you all should work to provide legal information and technical assistance and not legal advice. And I think that's an important place to start as we talk about this, which is that Many of you are in the Creative Commons Certificate Program exactly because you are the person in your practice community who other people come to for advice and information about how to create OER, how to work with the open licenses, and you wanna get more information about how to do that well and responsibly. Um, and at the same time, I think it's really important to remember that like, for different reasons, all of us are not well situated to give other people fact specific legal advice. I shouldn't do it because even though I'm a lawyer, I am not your lawyer. And I do not want to create that lawyer client relationship by giving you fact specific legal advice. And for most of the people in their certificate, um, you don't want to do it because you're not a lawyer and you're not their lawyer. And for all of these reasons, what we want to do is avoid giving fact specific legal advice. And what that really means is you want to avoid someone coming and asking you a question that is a fact question with a legal component that says, I want to do X, is that copyright infringement? Um, or I want to do X, is that, you know, can I then, could someone then do this under the license? And that's, those are really hard not to answer. I say that as a person who has been in this position for almost 15 years, it's hard because you want to help people. You want to say, yeah, that's easy. Don't worry about it. Um, and I think there are lots of good ways to help people and good ways um, to be empowering and not overcautious, right? One thing I think we see often in the space of education and libraries is people hear that caution of like, well, you can't give people legal advice. What they end up doing is giving people legal advice, just giving them really cautious advice, right? So people, what they do in fact is they say, oh, I don't think you can do that. I don't think you can do that is legal advice just as much as I think you can. And so, you know, we don't want to end up in this position of being hyper cautious, but we do need to be um, careful to, to give people all of the information and the context and factual cases we know about and hypotheticals we've talked about a lot, but not to give them sort of individualized thumbs up, thumbs down legal advice. Um, and I hope that that still um, leaves you lots of space to give them useful information, to tell them how you've done stuff, to say how other successful projects have worked, to give them legal information. But that last question of like, am I going to do this? That needs to be their decision. Um, and I hope that I can model that here, but I want to pause because I know everyone is 
has a video off and just take a moment and see if anyone wants to either raise their hand for a question or put a question in the chat. Does that question about that distinction about legal information versus legal advice make sense to folks? I'm going to assume that, assume that the silence is overwhelming agreement. Uh, the other question I think is, you know, how many of you maybe have experienced that situation where you feel like you are um, tending to be really overcautious maybe to try to avoid that? And I want to encourage two things. One is don't give legal advice. The other is don't be overcautious. As much as lost in terms of mission and practice by doing nothing, as by doing too much. And so I want to encourage people to try to figure out this middle ground, which is to give information and um, uh, examples and hypotheticals without giving advice. So with that said, we're going to um, jump into some of the questions that are in the document for the um, for this webinar, but what I will say is these questions come from, I think, across folks who are attending this session, but also the other session. And I would really like you to get a chance to answer the questions that are for people who are actually attending live right now. So if you have a question that is in that uh, questions Google Doc, and you're actually here in person, feel free to cut and paste it into the chat so that we can make sure that we actually answer it live while you're here. Um, and so try to sort of figure out, uh, how to sort of group these questions. Um, there's a couple of sort of easy ones, I think, which is like, there's one in here, which is like, why are certain creative works such as fonts and computer programs treated different from literary music and artistic works in US copyright law. Does the difference have to do with an inability to define these creative works explicitly? Um, I would say perhaps the opposite, that that difference is just because they have different economic, they have been decided sort of in the legislation and in the courts at different economic moments. And so I think that like, if you actually you know, I don't think there are really necessarily sort of coherent uh, big picture reasons that they are treated differently. I think often it's just courts and legislatures make decisions not from some sort of perfect principled place, but because in fact there's an outcome or a specific dispute sort of resolution that they want. Um, and so I think there are certainly parts of things that are protected by uh, copyright that don't actually make sense in the sort of big picture incentives of copyright. Um, and you also can see this in sort of technicalities of how courts deal with um, cases. So there's a case in copyright court saying, which is about the reimportation of textbooks. In that case, the court was like, I mean, I don't know, Congress didn't talk about it. So if you want to fix that Congress, that's your problem. Um, and then in the later case, Aereo, you could have had a similar sort of plain language reading that would have allowed Aereo, but the courts, I think, felt like that was too big of a disruption economically and found the other way. And so I think there isn't a sort of coherent through line to the statutory protections of copyright that the choices, they sort of just make the choices they're going to make. Um, on the question about the NC label depends on uses, not users. A CC wiki on NC says uh, a for-profit university may still include a link to an NC licensed courseware in a syllabus or, um, sorry, the question moved in a syllabus or on its paywalled website. And later, not all education educational uses are allowed. Um, so, you, you know, the use of your NC license may preclude your the use of your work in some educational contexts. So for the first half of that question, you can include a link to something regardless of the licenses. So um, at least in most cases, there's some edge cases where this isn't settled, but in most normal sort of mainline copyright cases, 
linking to something does not implicate copyright. So you can link to an NC material from any commercial context. And because you're not making a copy of that thing, uh, it doesn't implicate the license. So um, in that situation, and the first one, uh, I, I think you don't even get to the license. But if I were to rewrite that, um, I would say uh, that there are still situations where for-profit companies, not even for-profit educational institutions, but for-profit companies might use an NC material, might make copies of an NC material in some sort of incidental internal way. Like if you had written a really good NC explainer on some technical thing and they were just getting new hires like up to speed and they were like, here's this great NC thing. They made 20 copies, they passed it out to people. Um, I think there's a reasonable argument that that's not a commercial use. Like it's a commercial company, but that they're not like charging for that training. It's not like a commercial, a primarily commercial activity of itself. Um, and I do think that broadly speaking, the NC interpretation focuses on that specific use. Like what is happening there? Are they charging for it? Are they, is it a core part of some commercial offering? And so I think in that situation, using an NC material, even just at a regular for-profit company, um, is within the bounds of what might be non-commercial. I will say that like CC has sort of two separate bodies of writing on this. They have the license, which is what a court will interpret. And then they have all of this other stuff, like the wiki, which a court could in theory choose to look at, but it has no binding effect, right? CC cannot control the meaning of the NC licenses outside of the four edges of the paper, right? So the NC license means what is written in the legal deed of the license plus what a court finds. And so the court could find the other stuff that CC writes relevant, but they're not required to, right? CC can't come in and say, it doesn't say this on the paper, but this is what we meant. They could write a brief that says that, um, but they can't, they don't have like a legal controlling right to later alter what that says. And that's good and bad, right? Because there's certainly situations in which members of the larger Creative Commons community might want one outcome, but because these are legal documents between licensor and the licensee, CC is not a direct party to that. It's also why we don't have like a registry where you have to apply for a CC licenses. These are tools put out into the public for people to use. Um, and I think that comes into play in the second part. Not all educational uses are necessarily non-commercial. So your use of an NC license may preclude the use of your work in some educational contexts. And this is one where there are some real differences of interpretation. So in the US, there is a series of court cases where uh, educational publisher Great Minds had gotten a grant. Um, it was a grant from New York State, but it was federal flow through money. And they'd created um, OER and they'd put a CC by NC license on that OER and they sued FedEx and Office Depot when school districts had those materials printed there. And they said, you're printing these materials for a commercial purpose, licenses, non-commercial. Schools can use them. Schools can print them internally, but they cannot have them printed there. Ultimately, the court found that in those situations, the uh, two printing companies were operating within the license of the school. Uh, I don't think it was a guarantee that it would be found that way. I think there were copyright professors, you know, on both sides of that issue, um, with the other argument being that each individual user is a is a licensee. And so um, I'm happy they found that way. I think it's the right decision, but we weren't, it wasn't a guarantee. I would also say that um, there's differences within, you know, users of the Creative Commons licenses are not one sort of single unilateral community. Um, I think... For example, in the United States, we're very, very comfortable with the use of CC licenses in tuition bearing higher education, right? Just because you're paying for higher education and these OER textbooks are a big part of that, 
that it does not, in fact, make those commercial transactions. Um, I don't know that it's true everywhere. There's at least a period of time, um, I haven't talked to people about it recently, but there was at least a period of time where, for example, folks in Creative Commons circles in Germany and folks in Wikimedia Deutschland were very much uh, in opposition to that and said, well, no, if you're using OER in tuition bearing education, that's a commercial use. So we have this printing case, we have that case. I think there's also been cases where, not, not litigation, sorry, the printing cases were litigated. The other two were just discussions. Um, but uh, in the those cases and cases about whether schools can print for cost recovery, I think those are gonna be there. And so um, again, folks will have to choose which license they personally will use. But um, when I am giving people advice about thinking about licensing, I always say, I would rather focus on helping the people you want to help and collaborating with the people you care about collaborating with and sort of building that community, focus on enabling the good actors more than trying to hamstring the bad actors. But I think that spending time and energy trying to choose more restrictive licenses and to sort of focus on um, the uses that you don't want is ultimately less rewarding, that you cannot um, you cannot really completely control the actions of bad actors and that the more um, that the more productive thing to do is to focus on doing the best you can to enable the good actors that are actually in your community. And so I think for that reason, I encourage folks to pick the least restrictive license that they think they can work with. Um, I also think you can always add in requests separate from your license. Sometimes people, uh, I think, pick more restrictive licenses because they want to be asked about stuff. Um, and I always remind people that you can always ask for something that is not legally binding. You can always say, hey, I'm putting this out there. If you update it or if you're using it a different way, please let me know. Not everybody will, but some people will. And I think just reminding folks that it's not just the stuff in the licenses that you have to rely on. Um, I'm just gonna go through and see my questions. Um, the next question is, is it okay to bind together uh, various articles that are freely found on the internet in a packet to give to students? If a professor orders an article through ILL, can he provide that article to all the students in his class? Um, and is a copyright violation to change a format from DVD to MP3 for students to use in a reserve? Um, so uh, in a very lawyerly way, I will say uh, the answer to all of these questions are twofold. One is it depends. And two is the librarians at your institution are gonna have opinions about that from a sort of mixed law and risk policy standpoint. Um, generally speaking, just because something is freely available on the internet does not in some categorical way reduce its copyright protection. Um, I think there are certainly some types of implied license that are provided. Uh, like, you know, if, if you're reading an article on a newspaper website and it has a little print icon, I would argue that there is sort of this implied license that you can print a copy of that, right? I think it'd be very hard for them to come back and say you couldn't. Um, but just because articles are freely found on the internet, I don't think there is a categorical right to bind those into a packet and distribute those to students. Um, I think in the US, what you would have to do is sort of go through and make a article by article fair use determination um, as a sort of blatant self promotion. Uh, a couple of years ago, I put out uh, best practices and fair use for open educational resources um, that I'll drop in the chat in a minute. Um, but that is one way to sort of think through those questions. Um, and, you know, again, the question sort of through ILL is to be like, what is that article being used for? How much of the article are you using? Um, in all of these contexts, using, having the pedagogical context be clear. So speaking to US fair use law and then US and Canadian fair dealing, um, that the context is is really important for that. And so, for example, 
if you're creating a new OER and you're using excerpts from a lot of different sources that are sort of highly contextualized and sort of reframed in that OER, you have a much stronger fair use uh, argument there than you are if you're just having sort of a bunch of articles loosely together without that sort of in like direct purpose. Um, and then for the format shifting, uh, you have the copyright questions there, but then you separately have DMCA questions with have to do with um, uh, using things like DVDs that have uh, copy protection on them. So I'm just going down into the chat. Um, Can I um, jump in here quick, Meredith? Sure. Um, one of the questions I just wanted to get, uh, speak to as a librarian. Um, <laughs> So there was the question about um, if a professor orders an article through ILL, um, and this is really similar to a question I get a lot about um, using articles from library purchased databases. Um, and there's, so there's sort of copyright considerations, um, but one of the things librarians need to often keep in mind is um, the licensing agreements that the library has signed in order to get access to these electronic resource databases. Um, so when I was in my academic library, um, we there were lots and lots of online journal articles, for example, that were not openly licensed, but that our faculty and staff and students had access to because the library paid tens of thousands of dollars a year for subscription access. Um, but part of our life, part of that licensing agreement, that contract we signed when we made that purchase was that um, professors were not allowed to download a PDF of that article and then put that PDF somewhere like in Canvas or in their LMS course shell. If they wanted to share that article with their students, they needed to link to the article in the database and then the student would use their login to go and access it through the library resources. So sometimes there are sort of these extra considerations. Um, there's kind of what copyright law says, but if you've signed a contract or entered into an agreement outside of that, then you also need to think of those things and keep those considerations in mind. Um, and if I said anything incorrect, Meredith can can step no, in. I'm... But that, that's a thing like librarians have to think about all the time. And I always used to get weird questions from faculty that like, but why? And I'm like, because publishers are weird, but we signed a thing. <laughs> yeah. Can, I, can yeah. I jump in too and just add to what Shanna said? This is Liza, I'm at Salt Lake Community College. Um, our University of Utah uh, online journal search has a really cool thing where it'll show you what databases the journals are in. And one of the things it does that's kind of neat is it actually has a drop down that you can show the licenses. So you can see if they can ILL it and who they can ILL it to, and also like what those people can use. Um, so I don't know if other big libraries do that. Um, University of Utah's R, R, our R1. So it's like the biggest library in the state um, as far as academic libraries go. Um, so any of the rest of you who are at R1s, if you can add that to your, ILS or your, you know, your system, that would be kind of cool. Um, I wish we could add it to ours. We probably could, but we just haven't. Um, so it's, it's, it's a cool extra thing for that particular need. That's a really good point. And I think it's how like, you know, you can have all the copyright education that you want, but if you don't also think carefully about those contracts and the implementation of them, you will end up not even having, as much as people feel like copyright law is restrictive, if you don't sort of fight the fight and read carefully in those institutional agreements, you will end up with even less than the already sort of mediocre copyright bargain. You know, this is also true. There are some agreements that try to say, you, you know, you cannot rely on fair use in any other uses of this content similarly. And I would encourage folks to read carefully and, you know, if at all possible, avoid signing those. Um, so there's a couple other questions here. So, um, there's a question here that says, if this journal, if a, if a scholarly journal uses a CC BY license, but requires authors to transfer their copyright to the journal, is that acceptable? If so, what rights are actually being transferred? Um, and like, based on your understanding of CC BY, the author should retain copyright. 
so in a typical uh, sort of normal CC situation, you, the author, just openly decide to use the license. You put out the CC by license, you retain copyright. And what that means is you have the ability to, um, to sign and enter into separate licensing agreements. So for example, you could put your thing out under a CC by copyright license, but uh, a big publisher could decide they don't want to have to attribute you. They want to get to, you know, pretend it was written by somebody else. And so they want to write a different license that says you get them permission to publish it without attribution, which is a permission you could absolutely give them. And you do that, or you put something out under a CC by NC license and someone decides they want to make it into a movie or a book. And so they write a separate license with you. You, you as the author can have the CC license, but because you keep copyright, you can sign these other licenses. You can do other things with your copyright as well, in addition, um, in parallel. And in the journal context, I think two things are happening. One is they take copyright because that's what they've always done. And the other is it gives them ownership of that work and the ability, for example, to impose other conditions in other types of transfers. So the article might be available under a CC license, but they might want to include it in a large database in which they have other restrictions or control, or also they just want the ability to relicense it in the future. So for example, um, if they want to do something in the future that is not considered to be under the CC by license, if they're the owner of the article, if you transfer it to them, um, then they are the owner and can do that. And so I think to the question of, is it acceptable? I mean, we allow like a huge freedom of contract. So like, is it a good policy on part of the journal? You know, I don't think it's particularly good policy, but is it legal and does it work within the legal functioning of the licenses? Absolutely. Okay, thank you. So if there is no other license, the only license in CCBI, BY, and we are not talking about the future rights maybe, so that the journal is diamond open access and it is CCBY license, I am the author, which right do I give it to them? Well, the intellectual rights belongs to me. There is no commercial rights. So it makes no sense for me. It should be, the, the author should be the copyright holder. They're just doing it as a, a self-protective business practice. I don't think it's a good choice, but it's just them saying, well, we don't know what's going to happen in the future. We don't, we don't want to be constrained by this license somebody else wrote, so we want it all. I don't, okay. you know, I don't think it's a good thing, but I think that's what they're, that's what they're doing. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, this is a question uh, from Juliana in the chat about um, the problem of publishing works where the copyright uh, duration is set by life of the author plus a term, which is true in, in most situations. And um, so you don't know when that is, right? And so this is sort of one category of this broad sort of orphan works problem, which is that it's um, it's often very hard to know what is in fact under copyright. It's very easy to know what's under copyright in the last, you know, 20 or 25 years. It's very hard to know when you go back into the, you know, first half of the century. Um, and so I think... Uh, there's this provision of Brazilian law that you can make it available under a free license on Wikimedia Commons. In other countries, in like in the US, I think there isn't sort of a broad provision like that. But in many situations, what we would talk about is sort of the overlap between what fair use permits and uh, the problem of orphan works. Like this is broadly under the orphan works problem. Um, and so for in many of these situations, when there is this sort of high level of orphanness where you don't, you can't track down the author, their older work, they're not administered, they're often thought of as orphan works. And there's a actually a code of best practices and fair use for orphan works um, to think about how to deal with these collections that have 
um, large numbers of work that aren't uh, currently administered, that there isn't a practical way to contact a copyright holder. Yeah, um, maybe I can also jump in. Um, so regarding the issue of orphan works, especially in Kenya, um, our law doesn't actually recognize it. So if you do come across orphan works, you cannot use it. And we've had various cases of creatives who wanted to make music uh, and they wanted to use music from the 60s or the 70s. And because the law says no, then there's really nothing you can do about it. So it's quite interesting that Brazil allows that kind of use. I think, yeah, from a policy standpoint, I think it's um, a really good policy standpoint. Um, in the US, we also don't have an orphan works legal framework. So we rely on fair use as we do for so many different um, situations in which we don't have a specific provision in the law. The EU does have um, orphan works protection uh, provisions, but they are so um, onerous in terms of how much search you have to do that they're really um, only useful in sort of certain exceptional cases. Okay. Um, so a question here is how should we attribute images when using PowerPoint Designer? Um, PowerPoint Designer suggests the slide designs and images, but I can't find any attribution for the images. For now, I've created this AI notice. Um, unless otherwise noted, the in-app PowerPoint Designer tool was used to generate the slides. Slide designs, including the images, PowerPoint images have no creator information. So is this slide text considered prompting? So maybe say a little bit. Um, uh, so do you want to say a little bit more about this question, just so I understand, like sort of what? There's a couple of questions buried in here, and I want to make sure I answer the correct ones. I don't know. Can you hear me okay? My yep. microphone isn't working well. Okay. Loud and clear. Okay. Thank you. When I am using um, PowerPoint with the in-app designer, yeah. the uh, images will pop up depending on the content of my slide. And I'm not sure where those images come from, if they're created by people, if they're AI, there's no attribution I can find, no... Uh, citation. So I'm not sure how to um, attribute those images. Sure. Um, and so I think, uh, I mean, and, and just maybe to ask a following question, there are a couple different reasons attribution might be important. Why is attribution important to you in this context? I want to give credit if they if the images are uh, made. I'd, I'd like to know if the images are AI, and I'd like to give credit, especially to a human being, um, if if that's how the images were made. Um. So I think this is an an interesting question. Um. If it were me. I think I would stick to a sort of stick to the part that you know, which is to say, like, are you are you thinking about putting the slide deck out under an open license for the for your created content for you, like your narrative content? Well, I've been creating uh, these PowerPoints for the course using a CC license, so I wanted to make sure that um, I'm I'm following my own. CC license correctly sure. by what I'm including in the PowerPoints. And yeah, if I were to use these for faculty presentations or so on, especially when they're about Creative Commons licensing, I'd like to feel more confident that I'm actually following the licensing correctly. And I think this is a question, especially with the explosion of AI that more and more people have questions about is how do we know where the images are coming from and how do we attribute them if we don't know where they're coming from. Sure. Um, so I think in this specific case, the right answer for me would be to say the, you know, the text in these slides are under a Creative Commons license 
by Issa Keller. You know, the text in these slides title, whatever the slides title is, is under a Creative Commons license. Uh, the images and layout are stock from Microsoft PowerPoint, uh, whatever the tool is called, PowerPoint Designer. Um, and I wouldn't say anymore because you just don't know anymore, right? Um, probably some of those images are stock images, probably soon, if not already, some of them will be AI images. But um, I would just do, I would just say what you know, right? Um, because you don't know anything else. Um, yeah, that's right. I don't know anything. <laughs> Thank you. And, and so I would just, I would just say, you know, these are here. If you, you know, if there is um, if you're creating them for like a really public purpose, I might, um, so this thing linked on Microsoft, uh, royalty free generally means sort of like a, it's not the same as, as CC zero, you can have terms on a royalty free thing, but I mean, and this is a hard, I think this is a hard thing for people who are trying to be very responsible in uh, libraries and education and when they're really trying to like learn and follow the rules. Is there stuff like this that's just sort of um, super low risk and not very well defined because Microsoft doesn't have a great interest in giving you definition, right? Like. And so there's a bunch of stuff out there that is at this like intersection of, it's not in Microsoft's interest to give you a clear definition. It's also not in Microsoft's interest to pick some fight about this dumb free imagery that makes people hesitant to use their stuff. So you're never gonna get a ton of black and white clarity. Um, and, I would say generally, unless you have a reason to believe that you are the like one in a million case that Microsoft's going to come pick a fight with, I wouldn't bother. If you are that one in a million that Microsoft is going to come pick a fight in, then I would not use PowerPoint, right? Like um, if you're out there running the European campaign about that cloud software that Microsoft and Google are currently like stomping all over each, about each other about, I would 100% not use their templates or their pictures. I would use stuff that was like CC licensed or that I had paid some, you know, intern to like carefully draw me the template. Uh, for everybody else, like this is just in that sort of uncertain valley of low value tolerated use for which there is going to be no clear answer. And you should just be clear to your later users. This is a template from Microsoft. This is here and this is that. And to be honest, for later users, in theory, it is possible, depending on the details of Microsoft's actual policy, which that website is very much like the human readable version, there is going to be a licensed version of that. I don't know why I'm getting balloons, but this is wild. Thank you, Zoom. Um, so here it says you could use, you know, there are ways in which Microsoft could later argue that, that some other person who used these slides under the CC license didn't have a Microsoft 365 license, couldn't use those stock images. But that's just not very likely. And so part of operating in this space, in the same way that you accept the risk that something has a CC license on it, that was put there by someone other than the actual author. Like there's always going to be this like little low background risk. In the same way that there's always gonna be like a low background risk that if you have a chemistry class, one of the kids is gonna like, you know, burn their hand or set their lab bench on fire, that there is no zero risk activity, but this is just super low risk. And I think the the thing for you to do is mark what's yours, be clear about where the other stuff came from and don't worry about it too much. I know that's a sort of only medium satisfying answer, but it is my answer. Thank you. Anyone else have questions? That's a good, I think that's an area people do get sort of uh, caught up about stuff. Um, and I want to see there are other, there's a bunch of people in the chat. Um, 
And I'm just trying to see if there's any other part. So there's going to be like, um, you know, they're going to, Microsoft's lawyers, unsurprisingly, are going to write the terms of service in a way that provide them with as much certainty as possible and you with the le least amount of certainty as possible. And so you're probably not going to find like, um, like an answer there that gives you absolute certainty to operate. Yeah, I think a similar question we get a lot, Meredith, um, is about tools like Canva. So like Canva is this design tool, you can create infographics and stuff. They also have a number of like stock templates and little graphics and icons and stuff that you can use. And their terms of use, similar to what Liz put in, micro in the um, chat about Microsoft's terms of use are like all those like little icons and images and templates are Canva's property. And so we get questions about, well, can I CC license something that I created in Canva if Canva owns this stuff, right? Like only the copyright yeah. holder can, can CC license a thing. And so like, what does my license cover? Can I do this? Yeah, I mean, I think again there, I would go with an answer that, um, that bridge this gap between being like a technically sufficient answer and also pointing people in the right direction and skipping the sort of worst legal messiness in the middle, which is to say, this is a stock, you know, I would put a similar, when I, when you license it, I would put a similar thing that says, you know, all of the content and all of the attributed images are, you know, all the content, but the real answer, what that would look like in the messy real world, right, is all the text here is CC by Meredith Jacob. The images are, you know, licensed under their respective licenses, except for these three images, which are included based on fair use. The template is a standard Canva stock template. Period. Right? Um, and... other users are going to have to decide for themselves if that like sort of infinitesimal risk is a risk worth taking. I wouldn't go to some big effort to like, I do not think that's a meaningful risk, right? You could, it's, some of the Canva templates are not going to be copyrightable, right? Like if you have a thing that is like a plain thing with like a couple lines and some squares, that's probably not copyrightable. So some of the templates just don't rise to the level. Like for example, if you had a template that was like a, probably don't do this anymore because nobody knows what these things are anymore, but it was a sheet of like loose leaf paper, like lined loose leaf paper, right? And it had the blue lines and it had the pink lines. Canva could have that template but they don't, there's no copyright in it. And so it just wouldn't, I would sort of be concise and be clear and mostly not worry about it too much. I think um, a different category that it is important to think about is if you have um, stock image databases for which you have paid a license fee as an institution, that is an entirely different category, right? that's more like the scholarly journals where you have paid a subscription fee so they're free for you but they aren't free for the public so i don't know about those i don't know how often those are true in institutional contexts but it's certainly true if you paid for a paid stock image right and you paid for a license for that that you really have to be very careful about including that in oer but sort of for this incidental template and design stuff you know, there isn't one answer. I cannot give you a yes, no one will ever complain answer, but it does not strike me as like a, a peak concern. But you should note it so that other people know what they're getting, what they're getting. Is that answer moderately satisfying, not satisfying, or very satisfying to people? I found it very satisfying. I don't know about others, but that I'll was great. It. Thank you, Meredith. <laughs> um... You know, we've also gotten lots of questions about like how to attribute stuff that was created with AI. And again, I would just urge people to like a common sense approach that that communicates concisely and effectively. So for example, 
Um, I think there is very little meaning to putting anything in for people who have used AI and process tools, right? Like if you've used Grammarly, if you've used AI tools for, you know, sort of normal, regular image processing, um, if you've used AI tools for sort of writing organization, I don't think there's a big upside to including those. I think that sort of ends up being noise rather than signal. Um, I think that uh, on the other hand, it's probably important from both a copyright standpoint and like a factual reliability standpoint of a sort of communication and information standpoint to indicate if you have images or text that have large chunks that are wholly AI generated and um, and without sort of human revision or, or, or you know, alteration. And that's probably because of copyright because those things aren't copyrightable, but it's also because, you know, it's sort of a, a, a reference to others that they might want to just contextualize them differently. I think we're gonna see that there are in fact some types of resources that it's really unproblematic to have AI generate and some for which it is. And so I don't think we can sort of predict right now that moment. And so instead, I think what's important is sort of communicate to current and future readers just what the facts on the ground are. There's a question about a student work being published that I have now lost. Um, how about social media? A student had an original poem posted on the library's Instagram and now wants to submit the poem to a college art journal that requires a submission has not been previously published elsewhere. Would a social media post count as an official publication? Um, so I think from a copyright law standpoint, it would probably be published, right? You are sharing it out to the public. Um, I don't, uh, from a literary journal standpoint, a world about which I know nothing about and I'm giving you my absolute hot takes, uh, I would say that if, if you were asking me this question as an informal colleague, I would say, I don't think that uh, an institutional, spotlight is the same as a outside publication. Uh, but that is a question for people who think about uh, literary journals and publications. So I would encourage anybody on this call who has experience with that to maybe unmute and mention it. But to me, I would say that um, in the same way that in like a scholarly work, posting something, you know, posting a preprint on your institutional page on and Chad's gonna laugh at me because I don't remember the names anymore, but like B Press or whatever, the new digital commons or whatever, that that, that isn't, that wouldn't count as publication if a journal says, you know, you can't have published elsewhere. Chad, do you have a thought on this? Yeah, I mean, again, it's a thing, a lot of um, librarians who advise like faculty and student authors, question we kind of run into a lot. Um, and my advice is usually just ask the publication what they mean, well, ask the journal, if this counts as prior publication or not. In general, most journals would not consider this a prior publication. Essentially, they just wanna make sure that you haven't already published it in another journal. You know, like they want credit as like the journal that published the work. Um, but it just depends, like, you know, some of them might get really touchy and say, no, we really wanted to debut this work and if it's out in the internet, then we don't want it. But most places will say, yeah, you put it on Instagram, we don't care, that's fine. We just didn't want it to be like under a publishing agreement with another publisher somewhere. And that certainly would be my, that would be my hot take entirely outside my area of expertise, but that is absolutely what I would tell them. Okay. Um, if there are any questions that I have missed, um, I would just encourage you to unmute and say so. It's good to have them in the chat, but it also means that um, as we move forward, I could miss them. Okay, um, let's look for some in the document because I think we've answered most of the ones in the chat right now. Um, 
is it a violation of copyright to add captions to a video that is missing them? Um, so I think uh, there's, there's, you know, there's specific parts of copyright law outside of fair use that deal with making materials available to people with print disabilities. Um, and I think this activity might well be covered there, but I also think that you have a very strong um, fair use argument, and then also just a very strong sort of normative argument that um, this is in fact something that is required by your obligations, particularly in educational context, required by your obligations to your students with disabilities. So um, I think this is a very low risk activity. And at least in the US, I would have no hesitation doing it. Um, and I think there's a there's an there's an implied question here, which is if to make a copy of uh, a video that has captions, do you if you needed to download it from YouTube and make a local copy to add those captions, I think um, that is something that could also be covered by your by your legal rights there to make that copy to make those captions. And it's one of the reasons I think we often talk about the deficiencies of linking out. So here we talked about how linking out doesn't implicate copyright, and that's true, but um, it also often doesn't serve your mission. And so when we talk to folks in the open education space, we often encourage them to think about whether or not it's actually more important to do the fair use analysis and be like, okay, what part of this video do I actually need? I'm gonna download it and embed it so I can do things like make sure that it has captions, make sure it has other accessibility features, make sure that students without broadband still have access to this resource. So it's a reason that even though linking out is low copyright risk, it can actually be higher mission risk. Um, So there's a question for clarification. Ideas and facts cannot be copyrighted. Does that not imply that research generally does not fall under copyright? Um, for example, only particular expressions such as formulations in a research paper would. And um, yeah, that's true, I think. Uh, sort of not exactly how I'd state it, but when you publish a research paper, what you own is that paper. You have no legal control over the ideas in that paper. And that's exactly how copyright is supposed to function, right? You get protection in your specific publication, but not in the ideas in it. Um, even when those ideas are really new and really valuable. Um, in terms of attribution, attribution norms are professional norms, but they're generally not legal norms. So if you have a really good idea a really good way to do something, a really smart process, really new information about the world, that all has value, but it is not value that is protected by copyright. And in different professional contexts, people might need to attribute that. But in a sort of general obligation of the public, there is no attribution requirement for that. Do you know what? There are a lot of questions sort of bound up in that distinction between idea and expression in factual work and in, um, the sort of imperfect overlap between what copyright protects and what uh, professional norms around plagiarism and attributions and credit might protect. Does anyone have any questions there? That's an area I think that often can be pretty tightly bound up. Uh, sorry, Mary, just a quick note. Um, we have about four minutes left, so perhaps um, if you have a burning question, Meredith can take that, and then we'll we'll wind up. Great, thank you. Um, well, since we don't have any burning questions, I get well. Guess we'll let folks go. I want to say thank you for coming, um, and thanks for taking part in the certificate and. Uh, hope to see you all out doing your great work in the future. Great. Thank you so much, Meredith, for that really informative session. We really appreciate it.
Uh, and thank you to everybody who attended today. And of course, if you do have any questions relating to this, um, remember the video will be uploaded for you to be able to review. And then you can reach out to us, um, facilitators, uh, for any um, further concerns regarding this topic. So thanks uh, again, everyone. And we will we'll see you at the next session on the 5th of November.